Before each poet, I introduce each poet, I'm going to read a brief poem. Um, this poem is called Fife and Drum. Now, Johnny Mitchell wrote a poem called Fife and Drum. And this is my version of Fife and Drum. Her poem, her song is very, very beautiful. This is a little different. It's called Fife and Drum. I'll say one thing. Gyre is the circle that's made by a bird in the sky. That word comes up in this poem. Fife and Drum. Demented choirs, wailing shells, triptych wires, ashen fells, glinting pyres, phantom knells, moonscape sighs, blood-seared wells, raven's gyre, parched throat tells, fife's thin murmur, black earth quells. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce the first poet in our reading here. Uh, Robert Gibbons is a widely published poet. He has performed at many venues in the New York City area, including the Bowery Poetry Club, the Cornelia Street Cafe. I saw him perform at the Cornelia Street Cafe. Uh, he has a new book that's just been uh, published, and he's been published in many journals around, uh, um, around the city and around the country. And he was featured in our first edition of the Anti-Tea Coffee House Poetry Collective. So let's give a warm welcome to Robert Gibbons. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. My first poem is A Woman with Water. Whatever happened to the woman at Union Square? The one that sells water, her voice aqua, the sound barters in voluminous leaders. Maybe she's with Melville searching for Moby. Maybe she transcends like Rumi or the Sufi. Maybe she swims to the Atlantis or to Murr, sailing with Wallace Stevens lost in the blur. She tables her elements, H2O exile, on an island of stranded archipelago. Monk's Thrift Shop. I looked into the window of the vintage. All the rentals and storefronts are closed, outgoing, out of business, to witness such gentrification, such bifurcation. But you holding on like a gospel plow, tilling their fingers through the scripture like a baby holding to its mother's back, the old fashioned, the antique, the odd, the bizarre, they say it will not be another four years. These people don't care because they've never voted. They never had hope in the government, in this boom town gone bust, in this distrust of the white man. All those people on this dead end street, the nouveau riche, riche with steel and glass, with paper mache and demitasse. But what about the elderly? What about the geriatric? The elasticity of holding on. The shop begins to moan like a hymnal. It caught me up in the raptures, but it was me mesmerized by its windows, full of cameras, full of bric-a-brac, names with matic type, writers in orange, Indian, and voodoo dolls. It's the bowling shoes, and the two's unmanageable. Did not have to go uptown to hear Harlem calling, but it was the fire in the ghetto. The stilettos are no longer slingbacks. It was my chance to fall into trance. It was the pillaging of the East Village, the war walking through the burning everything in sight. But I kept standing there as the crowd congregates. We all wanted to relate to this is the last, a past footnote 
All has been done. All has been overrun. So I tried to entertain myself, but the window kept me there. We live in a blue house with flowers in front. Why this color? The stutter of sky, ocean, and twilight. The ancient Egyptians use la pi lazuli for heaven. And if Mary is satin on this facade of the headline, this mishap on a busy intersection, opening the newspaper, see this resurrection of two daughters left on the side of the road of the highway. Domini five and Diani three. When does pure blue come from spirituality? I see the pajama hooded down coat wearing Uggs, boots, disposable diapers left to refresh. When the police ask, she says, my name is Domini and my little sister is Diani. I felt the colors of sapphire. I asked the muses for mercy with this heightened power. I began to weep as I continue to read their story, but it was the turquoise that keeps me calm, so I will not worry. Then the oldest said, my mom's name is Delicia, and then it's the power of color, so maybe they can reach her. The little one continues by saying, we live in a blue house with flowers in front. The earthquake. The vulgar pigeons and sad nightingale did not remind me of her. Only the earthquake, only surgery in mineral Virginia, like a perjury of her last day, God's opening fresh ground, performing an operation that creeps through her body. Like tremors form varicose veins, only women whispering to women behind the flying buttress of a church fan, the utter dark men getting drunk, only little boys watching their elders in the back roads of Camden as I travel I-95, bypassing DC to NYC. I try to make peace, but she is in recess as I look from the window to the river as it transformed to seltzer. It renders her from human to spirit. Now I can only remember her from those bags of peaches. She reaches me by the side of the road. I can only hang on to the taste of 10 years ago, she is singular as an umbilical to my origin. I can feel her. I can see her voice still answering the phone. A tome as she ascends will never leave my thoughts. Only a bus ride to her. Only a greyhound to her voice. But she is in another state. I'm taking the long train home. Sorry, James Baldwin. I could not afford that rare book on Madison Avenue. I could not afford that blues for Mr. Charlie. I could not sell my soul to be published. Could not. So I'm going home on the long train, but the words of Winston Churchill at the Morgan and the building in front are forging. I could not afford the price, can never be concise, but can pay the cost could not but only walk, so they call you a rare book in that window, wrapped in plastic, could not afford the preservation, the preservation paper, could not assume the weather, if this means anything, but I'm sorry, James, I have to take the long train home. The missing page. We left the Cape, the fair cravere of rich red lobster, the sandpaper colored faces left an imprint. The rhyme only comes in Boston as the South seaports. I am an attachment to the ferry of waves, pulling back the curtains of the undiscovered as we rock like an ice tray. I became one of those people who faced the fear of jumping overboard that night. I met Hart Crane on the Brooklyn Bridge, leaving objects on the plank, all those bric-a-brac in my mind, the machination of planning here. I only see gulls, the glass bottom, a dune shack swept by force, the horse baying of whales sounding like a gong from a Northampton church. And no, I'm not New England, but I am as African as the keel of the ship, the rusting anchor below sea level, the marsh grasses had to liken me, tearing these pages from this sodden journal, so steeped in things 
being who said I wanted to receive spirituality on a well watch. I want immortality like those who face the sea. William H. Seward. I followed the trail of misfits. I had to ditch the bookstore, the girls with their boyfriends in white, wife beaters in tight pants, the crotches revealing the show stilling needed to resolve to see those phantoms on the shelf. So I closed this chapter on James Baldwin again and again in his walk to fame. Cause reading is not good enough. Living it builds the trust. So I removed myself from the cafe with those fudge brownies and all those out-of-towners strolling Broadway. And yet the stodgy sitting outside with bistros and rag tops with Ray-Bans at dusk, chiffon dresses are still in my way. They speak something else, could be material or the fame, but I made it outside to Madison, beneath the flat iron and sounds of taxis far away to my inner sanctum. And there you were, William Seward, like a traffic cop on 23rd, where the birds congregate on your rostrum, your posture like an upright chair at a writing desk, your legs crossed of patina in high places, erasing this self-doubt, the rote, the lunching of people with money buying $10 hot dogs attached to a smartphone, pedigrees and unavailability. I'm caught up into their world, but the word stirred just for me, sitting up looking down on my peonage, my eyes focused on your quill. You calmed me down, this thrill. I knew this was the place after the humidity fell, with all my curiosity to sell, that their world was not mine, but I do have a story to tell. The man at the top of the stairs. He said, brother, give me some money for a cup of coffee, I'm hungry. The man at the top of the stairs, the marble of the Astor Library, the casting of the Wasgawa Lions, the Fifth Avenue traffic vanities and the occasional insanities became a crossroad with ox carts for books and references, wires and exhibits. Look took their public space to private. These souls we call vagrant. We try to hide it behind our words, our feigned sophistication, as if they do not exist. But what happened when they make your bathroom a campground, the McGraw Rotunda, their pool pit, those first editions and hanging tapestries will not save you from storming your Bastille. And it was the blind poet John Milton sees all and he feels for them. He is the one claiming this reading room. He is the one naming it Armageddon. Your closed off ropes are merely a joke because he is grassroots, not museum walls and highfalutin. The man at the top of the stairs took me on a tour without closest advisor. Where is his biography? Where is his arms giving? I understood before the library was built, it was a reservoir. So it's natural for the people to come back to the water, the sw salmon swimming upstream, release him from the hatcheries, the latch keys of language. The man at the top of the stairs held me in his grip. I knew I would be greeted at the Carrera stairwell with wine and brie and the key to a private bathroom with frames and hand sanitizers, Camille and lavender. He stood there and waited for me as I crossed the revolving door and the emotion in me began strain. I needed to practice what I preached. I needed to seek higher than those facades. He stood there and waited like Lazarus, standing near the gate licking his wounds. His wounds became my wounds. His news became my news. I settled back to the depression, to prohibition, to brother can I have a dime. I had a fever of yellow journalism. I had to keep some flame alive. I never knew where it came from, but maybe it was this man on this elevation. As simple as that, his voice, his character, his choice, his manner, he just wanted some crumbs. I'm almost done. I'm going to finish up. Chavis Carter. There will be no trials 
Only the miles it takes to walk to the cemetery. Only the dirge buried beneath earth that gives them way to mirth. Only the latter rain. Only that someone did not understand his humanity. His life a drive-by. A Tupac and a Biggie. A shell and a bullet. An assassination attempt on Malcolm X. A black man wearing a bulletproof vest. And he is another plot in Potter's Field. A steal away to slavery. Don't blame them. Do not name me in the crime. I'm not racist. I'm not blatant. It just so happens he was unarmed. And no, it's not Trayvon Martin, but another brother, someone's son who had breath and death with style and life. But he was a lamb and a slaughter. I'll finish up with my last poem. It's nominated for a Pushcart Prize called Kingdom of Land, Sea, and Sky. Only a picture reminds me of what I just left. For a few days now, the time changes to order back to East, the show business of empire, to return to the didactic, the refractive light. The sun can't break through on Times Square. The buildings leave us scraped as they tower the air, as they occupy Wall Street, owning us with their dominance and their prominence possessing a few, not many, giving some their dreams. I thought, imagine the landscape of New Amsterdam before the arrival of the Dutch and all others who claim sovereignty and seniority, the time of the beaver, of the Turtle Island, Block, Clinton Castles, maps drawn by cartographers, and it was the native instinct of the Iroquois nation before Washington made his great sojourn up the Delaware, I had a chance to witness the hood and the Helen of the West and the discoverable places. Even this present time, I had a chance to witness the sandstorms of the forest off Pacific City and the enormous width and breadth of the barks of Grecian and the Douglas fir. No wonder Thomas Jefferson sequestered Lewis and Clark and their famous assistant York to travel by keel up the Mississippi, lands of accomplished beauty, the kind with fortitude when breathing in clouds at noon to rise to the sound of the osprey or the murelet and the American coot. It makes me feel differently about the way we think and live, the way we take for granted the natural more than us. They are more beautiful and more ancient. Imagine counting the rings in the bottom of the redwood. Much of the forest has been cut back. It has been commercialized, but there is still enough vista point looking down so far. And it is all river and mountain and cloud until the dissolving of the haze. All I could do was journal like Lewis and Clark, like Catlin, like O'Keefe, like Robert Cole Scott. I had never seen the big feet of Lincoln as big as the Oregon oak, the breathtaking beauty taking us down the fast pace. And in the words of Mark Twain, I am the American, whether marginalized or scrutinized. If I live on the Delta or in the subway, I claim this land, as Richard Wright said, before those of us who are interested in the persimmon tree or the honeydew or the lemon yellow or the elk or a rose garden. You must go and must seek and must taste. You must find the grace in your own reality for it is big enough for all of us that stand like the jagged rock off Cape Mears, the mysterious ledges and lighthouses arouses me. It is from all of our spheres, all of our influences, all of our aviaries, all of our archipelagos, and all of our cypress swamps. And finally, it is the soil of America that claims me. I am the American. Mm -hmm.